Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Lizzie Frankie, and I'm editor at large at the BFI Film Fund. Um, also, disclaimer: I'm also was involved in the, the project as an exec producer, but I'm so utterly, utterly excited um, to be doing this interview because I've never really had a proper chance with a bit of space to talk about this film. Um, and I, obviously, the absolute toast of Cannes. And it's just thrilling. We just feel, for us, this is like job done when a filmmaker like you, Charlie, is out in the world. Um, I read the reviews today, and I kind of think it's amazing when reviews start making you cry, so let alone the film making you cry. I, I just want to congratulate you all. Amy and Adela, Charlie, can we just, go, first of all, give a round of applause for the beginning? Thank you. I, I should have been a bit more formal. Um, we have to the far um, left Adela Ramonski, who is the producer working from, with um, Pastel in the US. Amy Jackson, producer in the UK. And we have Charlie Wells here, the director. So I've got so many questions, but I want to make sure there's time for you to ask questions too, because I'm presuming you're all here, that you've seen the film. If you haven't, I know you, I mean, I know lots of people have been trying to get tickets because I've been like a hundred emails, people asking me to get tickets. Um, but the word I use or the phrase I've used, and I suppose I've always thought about it in the process of seeing you make this film. I think of um, Ada in The Piano. And there's a line where she and she, she's, she and Harvey Keitel, she, you know, she obviously, as we know the story of The Piano, but she, said, she says, he understands her music. It's the mood that passes through. And I just think of this film as the mood that passes through. And that takes such extraordinary technical precision and emotional sort of anchorage. Um, I want to start off asking about the kind of, in a way, before we expand into your, you know, your journey, but I suppose the journey of the film, the sort of the first fragment that for you, that you've built this, this, this extraordinary film. What was the first image? What was the first thing that you think I'm going to build? And then also you built the film in terms of the way you brought everyone together. Um, it's interesting because normally with shorts, there has been an image I can point to very clearly. And with this one, I feel like I've been telling the story of an image that I'm not totally sure whether that is true or not. But it's kind of a funny story, so I've gone with it. <laughs> um, I wonder if there was an image. There are definitely images along the way. I think, I mean, it's true that I was flipping through photo albums early on and looking at holidays that I took with my dad as a kid. And there was one where I'm about five or six and I'm sitting like basically naked by a pool. And there is this like beautiful woman right behind me. And it, there was just a moment that I was looking at it and I was like, was I the subject of this picture? Is that just a coincidence? <laughs> And I think like I took that as like a seed and I began to write quite like a fictional, more conventional than the film wound up being feature film about a father and his daughter on holiday, maybe meeting a woman and kind of navigating those two parts of himself. That was the starting point and it was a long journey from that starting mm -hmm. point, which was maybe back in like 2014 or 15, 15. Um, that was where it began and then, you know, where it ended was somewhere a little bit different. And you, you so you, um, you're from Edinburgh, but you moved to New York to study NYU. And what I sort of love about where you're positioned, you, you're the best of American indie and you're the best of European cinema in a way reflected by your two producers. So maybe you, you, Adela, when did you first meet Charlie? And I mean, she had this body of shorts, you had a body of shorts at Sundance and you, I think through the Sundance labs as well, or you, did you navigate Yeah, I mean, that? that was a little bit later on right. in the process, but yeah, when I first met Adela, I think I'd made all of my shorts. Yeah. Can I ask really quick, just show of hands, like who's seen the film so we kind of understand? Oh, that's amazing. Okay, cool. Um, we met, yeah, in like 2017. Uh, I had seen Charlie Shorts and I was excited to talk to her as a filmmaker about maybe where she was trying to go. Um, and she said she had this script, which it turns out she didn't have. <laughs> <laughs> but I said, oh, great, we'd love to read that. And uh, she eventually, two years later, sent it on. Did I tell you I had the full <laughs> You. <laughs> Probably, I mean, I believe it. You were generous with yourself in terms of <laughs> <laughs> where you were at in the process. Um, 
And then once there was a script, it was finally something that we could start talking about and how to build and how to find the right partner in the UK to work with. Um, and it kind of, you know, from there to here was a few years on. And then Amy, how did you get involved? Um, so I met Adela in Sundance 2020. Um, we were just, I think, through mutual people. We were kind of sneaky. We were like, we should meet generally, but like we knew we had this thing <laughs> that we were hoping Amy would want to do with us. Um, so, and that was a great meeting. Um, we got on really well, clearly. Um, and then the lockdown came, and just as the sort of lockdown had happened in the UK, Adela got back in touch and said, hey, so there's this project, and would you like to have a conversation with Charlie? Um, and so we all got on a Zoom together when I was stuck in the Highlands of Scotland. Um, and it was a real high point for me. <laughs> um, and then that was it, basically. And we have a very m m important missing ingredient in terms of the journey, because I see Eva Yates over there, who is now head of BBC Films, but she was the person who first flagged Charlie to me. Um, and Eva was in, in I kind of think, was it Adela? Did you, had you been talking to Eva or, or, or Charlie? How, how did the... Because that I think yeah, I'm trying to remember. Do you do you remember exactly the sequencing? Because you were in touch with Eva. We had just had a really beautiful experience with BBC on Eliza Hitman's film, so there was already a conversation that had begun. And then I think I know Charlie was already. I can't see you, Eva, but I guess she was hiding behind the corner. <laughs> yeah, there she is. I I think you guys were already in conversation. Like yeah, yeah. F formally, formally, yeah. Like I think we we both brought the project to Eva at the BBC, but for two years on my computer, I don't know if I've told you this, there was like a working document just called After Sun for Eva, <laughs> um, that is was like kind of a lookbook that I was putting together, still unfinished, one day. Um, yeah, like it's Sundance in 2017. Somebody shared a list of delegates, sneaky list of delegates with me, and I just wrote to Eva out with the blue, and she met me for breakfast. Um, and we stayed in touch kind of through various things. So, uh, yeah. So also what I find interesting, because when you were making your shorts, you were also kind of involved in producing them. So you know the importance of bringing a really sort of robust machine together in terms of getting something like this onto the road. So I kind of think what's great is that you, as a producer, were then able to hand that, that bit over to Adela and to Amy and then really focus on your first feature where you were just being focusing on the creative side of things. Yeah, gladly. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, well, I, when I went to NYU, it was with an intention to produce and... Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, I was in like this very specific producing program um, and I made a film, and it was the collaborative aspect of it that kind of blew my mind. I had this great relationship with the DP of that film that was just so creatively satisfying, like it was push and pull in exactly the right way. Like, he would argue with some of my points, I'd argue with some of his points, and we would always kind of land, you know, in a place that we both felt good about, regardless of who it pushed it. And it just felt really exciting. Was that Gregory? It wasn't Greg, oh, actually. Okay. Greg was the gaffer on that one. Greg has worked <laughs> on all of my films in different capacities, right. including his yeah. DP. He shot laps. Um, he's a man of many talents. Uh, no, but it's somebody I still work with a lot. And uh, yeah, it was it was a collaborative aspect of it that was so exciting, as well as like the creation and the expression. And uh, yeah, so, so I think like finding the right people is, is everything. And I think it's really interesting that sort of, I, I didn't realize you'd gone to NYU for production, but in a way you've understood all the components. So again, and the fact I also I've seen that you were all swapping credits in terms of, of different bits of the process. I think that's going quite, I mean, really important in terms of again, but for the, particularly the kind of filmmaking you want to make. Yeah, well, I think that's one of the differences as far as I can tell between um, the way that different places approach film school, even within the US, not just UK, US, but like NYU specifically is very interdisciplinary and in that you have to take on each role at mm -hmm. some point. Mm -hmm. um, and that is something that I really value. Like everybody I work with does, like Greg also directs, mm -hmm. Blair also directs, mm -hmm. like everybody can do a couple of different things. Mm -hmm. um, and it does make the process mm -hmm a little bit different, I think, because mm -hmm. you're kind of taking input from from everybody, from different facets of it. Every, yeah, everybody's not coming from like a singular point of view. Mm -hmm. And I, the way that I make films, I, I really enjoy that. Mm -hmm. 
and you drew your initial crew from the pool of people you'd been working with. Yeah, in terms of Greg and Blair, yeah. like the, yeah. the cinematographer and editor, yeah. they've they've both worked on a lot of my projects. Yeah. I think I've worked on theirs. Like I produced their shorts. Um, yeah, I mean they're they're much more film educated than I am. They're like my primary taste makers, um, and I've learned so much from them. And then Amy and Adela, in terms of helping um, Charlie sort of, I suppose, build out and from, I suppose, in a way, if you're making shorts, you, you, I mean, comfort zone is not quite the right word, but you're working in a particular environment and so you're going into a feature space that has to sort of really pull its punches. And I think we can talk about the casting because to me that's sort of so extraordinary, but also speaks to how to build a film that is unique to your vision, but also finds ways, you know, the performances are the things that are going to con connect um, and, and make the alchemy of the film. Um, and I presume, um, uh, Amy and, uh, and uh, Adela, you were very involved in that sort of helping and supporting Charlie through the casting of the extraordinary Frankie and obviously the extraordinary Paul, but uh, uh, amazing that you've discovered Frankie and with Paul, you have kind of elevated him to, into the next place as, a, as an extraordinary, not just a great TV actor, but now we're seeing him as an extraordinary cinema actor. So could you, perhaps, how you sort of helped uh, Charlie navigate casting? After you. I mean, I think something that was unique to this project, and, and I really have to thank the BBC and the B BFI for this, was that we were, Charlie, like you were afforded a place to really take time with casting and, and not have to it, like Paul was the last piece, right? We started with casting uh, the role of um, uh, Sophie. Is that? <laughs> I, I think it's Sophie. <laughs> <laughs> we were allowed to start with that piece, which I think um, made sense to us and, and a lot of other more, I would say like, just films that get put together in a different way, whether it be studio or equity built, like <clears throat> that casting piece becomes just maybe the focus would have shifted to like the father role first. And we were allowed to, through the support of the funders, like focus first on, on casting uh, Sophie. And then, and also to spend a lot of time doing that. We spent like six months doing a very like legitimate um, search. So thank you. <laughs> I mean, it was, and it was, I mean, a way finding Frankie, I, I do remember conversations with Amy, because Amy, you were kind of with, with um, Charlie on the ground in Scotland, is that right? Uh, in terms of well, a lot of the so a lot of the casting was done um, on Zoom, wasn't it? On Zoom, yeah. So um, there was a, like a massive outreach that Lucy Pardy sort of led the charge on, um, and you had you were like inundated with submissions, right, across the yeah. Board, I think there so were about eight hundred all in exactly. All. So um, so there was a huge trolling process through that, and that was all online by virtue of the pandemic. So everyone, that was, you know, and so Adela was very much part of that process as well. Um, and then it came down to sort of whittling down that list, and then we looked to bring, you know, a smaller selection of those kids into a space in Glasgow. And actually, Adela, you were there for that as well. So we Did my quarantine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you took one for the team. Um, yeah, so then we had this sort of great experience together in Glasgow where we could meet those kids and do some chemistry work with some of the key kids that we pulled in for that role. I mean, it's a given, and I think I've repressed the memory, but all this was uh, happened and achieved through COVID. So it's extraordinary testament to, again, sort of the triumph of great producing in the face of extraordinary adversity. But I forgot that the first the, it was first done by Zoom. In fact, I yeah. first met you on Zoom. It's just that weirdness of... That as well. I mean, let's yeah. park that for a moment because everyone had to go through it. But to find, to be able to sort of find someone as extraordinary as Frankie, and then that the kind of process of matching up with finding Callum. Could, yeah. could you talk a bit about how you went through that with Lucy and? Yeah, but also just like before I do, I think one thing that's really special about Frankie is like Frankie was in our final sixteen of the kids that we met in person, but she was a huge surprise in person. Like, she was just amazing in a way that I don't think you can quite get to online, yeah. you know? Um, like, just seeing her transition between moods, seeing her... The thing with Zoom is, like, when you turn off the camera, you don't see the kind of aftermath. Whereas Frankie did this exercise on the first or second day where she sat down and had to kind of... Did a role play with Lucy where she was in a bad mood. 
And she just looked so devastated, so devastated. And then it ended and she was like on her feet and up and out. And Lucy came back in and I was like, was she okay? She was like, yeah, she said she just thought about her hamster for a minute. And, then, <laughs> and now she's fine. And then the second day she came in and I was like, oh, like, how are you? And she's like, my hamster died. And I'm like, whoa, that seems intense based on where you were yesterday. And she's like, no, it's fine. I got a chippy. <laughs> It, like she's amazing and just had this ability to like transition and that is really yeah. special. Like, she feels very robust. Like I didn't have to worry too much about her in that way. Um, and then Callum, um, yeah, we we had pursued different routes for searching Callum. Like it, you know, Lucy, Lucy and I did put in a lot of kind of thought and work into that process, and there were kind of two parallel parts to that. One was want like a more traditional casting avenue kind of through agents and looking at, at possibilities. And another was a more kind of street casting approach, which because of the pandemic just ended up having kind of too much limitation, I think. Because Paul had originally been unavailable, he was shooting God's Creatures over our dates. Um, and so I wasn't really, we weren't really able to pursue that beyond the very appealing idea of it. And then our, our dates shifted and, and that became a possibility and we shared the script um, with his team and with him and then we chatted. Um, it, was, it was funny seeing God's Creatures the other night because he looks in that film exactly as he did when I first met him. Um, and it was just a great conversation. One of those conversations that you leave on, on a high, you know? Um, just very, very excited and positive and that's a feeling always to be trusted, I think. And when did Frankie and Paul meet? They, we did a chemistry read on Zoom. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, uh, it was amazing. Like I have a still that I kind of compiled of them side by side and it was just like seeing that for the first time, you know, like seeing them next to one another. She, she really liked him. Um, and he was kind of trying to win her over, you know, like right from the get go. Uh, that was definitely one of those moments during casting that, yeah, that felt like the film, kind of the first view of what the film was to become. I'm sort of jumping about a bit, but just because you're wearing the T-shirt you're wearing, because one of the things I loved about the film is that you had a quite clear sense of the music right from the beginning. I mean, right from the beginning in terms of, obviously, certain scenes, of music is very, very important, but also even... Um, this, you know, the wonderful score by Oliver that was, you felt thematically you knew what you were doing. It wasn't about temp scores, it was about kind of what this, the film would sound like. Could you talk a bit about how, you, when you were working at the beginning of the film, did you, have a, did you have a mood track, a soundtrack in your head? I mean, obviously you had particular songs, but what, it feels like this, this film, After Sun, is, follows musical rhythms. So I just wonder if you could talk a little bit about that. Again, sort of constructing it, the technical side of thinking through something as exquisite as After Sun. Yeah, I mean, because I was writing for so long, I had this playlist for so long that I was gradually building. Um, and there were versions of the script in which music played a bit more of an overt role, like Sophie had a kind of musical world and Callum had a musical world and they kind of fed into each other like this and he would share his music with her. And that ended up drifting away a little bit from the film. I mean, there's this scene where they're side by side in the pool and it cuts back and forth between them. That's a, like, kind of one of those remnants of what used to be a bit more of like an overt through line in the script. Um, but a lot of the music, it's true, some of the music in the film was written from the script stage. Um, like my very subtle t-shirt that I'm wearing. <laughs> um, and we, we thought about alternates for that, you know, uh, and I just couldn't, it was really hard and we were really lucky that Lucy Bright, our amazing music supervisor, was able to secure it because some things you write and you think they were just fleeting thoughts and they're replaceable, but they're not. It's very, very difficult to replace them and, and Losing My Religion was one of those. And then other things were just discoveries during post, you know? Like there were lots of songs on that playlist that I would love to have been in the film that just didn't feel right. And there are tracks in the film that I never really would have considered and you're just experimenting and you throw them in and you're like, oh, that's exactly what this scene needs. And then Oliver's score, if you want me to talk a little bit about the scoring, like, yeah, there was a lot of experimentation with score. The very first cut of the film had 
every type of music you could possibly imagine in it. It was a mess, but it was us trying out what it might be. You know, is it strings? Is it piano? Is it electronic? Is it like, really everything? Um, and then my editor started pulling in some Eliane Radique, who is a French um, early pioneer of electronic music mm -hmm. uh, that worked with synthesizers in the 70s. And when I met with Ollie for the first time, he was like, <laughs> is that, that's Eliane Radique, um, who isn't, you know, like not, not everybody is going to be able to like identify her drone. <laughs> Uh, immediately and all he could and it turned out had composed like evenings of listening to Eliane Radique in churches like just just like was a huge fan and so it was a really exciting starting point because we had found that sound to work very well in the film and then Ollie is just amazing like what 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 he did with the score was one of those things that just felt like so elevated like so beyond anything I could have offered the film um, and we were lucky we got to spend a couple of days together in the end like refining certain things, there had been temp music in the film that was hard to, to overcome. Yeah. But yeah, what, what he did uh, I think is really special and it is something I wouldn't necessarily have thought the film might sound like at the beginning. And it's just one of those like joyful discoveries as you find it, you know? Mm -hmm. And obviously you had a fantastic mu music supervisor, but obviously also slight producer's nightmare in the sense, oh my God, under pressure, right, clearance? Did you, did, you had to be tenacious about that. And, and obviously again, great supportive producers and understanding how important those tracks and, and, and to make sure that they, that there was no, no argument, those had to be in the film. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Um, I think it was just well-timed, wasn't it? In terms of, I think we, at every step of the process on this film, um, Charlie knew very distinctly what she needed and was very could speak very passionately about how that would be in, crucial to creating the film she wanted to create. And so I think we recognised from the get-go that those tracks were going to be really important. Um, but obviously you have a limitation on the budget, so we cleared everything that we knew was going to be in sync on camera in the first instance and took care of those things and then parked everything else as a wish list for later down the line. And it just so happened that we were in a great position in terms of the budget as we entered into our post phase and then we had the support of our funders, you know, Lizzie and Eva um, and Kieran at Screen Scotland and Leah Booman at Tango and they collectively came together and said, you know, we see what's happening here and wanted to support putting that in the film because we were in the right position to make it happen. Um, I'm going to open to questions in a minute, but I just want to quickly um, sort of talk to Charlie about her journey to become a filmmaker because we were talking in Edinburgh when Charlie was editing the film back in the autumn and uh, one of the things that came through, because I used to be involved with Edinburgh Film Festival, and there was this wonderful thing called Scottish Kids Are Making Movies, and I love the fact it's are in the present, um, and it turned out, Charlie, you were part of that. And uh, you told me that you, you remember sort of the, sort of the influence of that, that moment as, as being important. Yeah, I mean, I didn't grow up watching a lot of art films in the film house where the organization was based. It's like very much like a cinema that, that screens those films. And it was the very first introduction to that world, a world I wouldn't really fully appreciate until much, much later. Like, you know, I had the like 10 pound pass for unlimited films at UGC, Cine World as it became, and we'd just go see whatever was on, you know, like the big, the big kind of Hollywood um, films. And there were kids, like 10 year old kids in there curating like Ozu programs. And I was just like, um, but it was, it was an experience that really stayed with me that I suppose it just presented that as something that could even exist, mm -hmm. which I think is the most important thing if you don't, come from a family of artists or people kind of in those fields, just knowing that it's even a thing out there that you could consider mm -hmm. uh, approaching or wanting to do was really important mm -hmm. in, in, in the short time that I was there. And, and obviously still, I mean, I think it would be fair to say that, uh, that the sort of funders, the kind of the, the, the government funds, uh, education is so essential, but I think that particular iteration um, back in the day was such an important one in terms of 
the people running it and the imp impact it had on people. Um, Mark Cousins and Shona Wood, who yeah. I, I bless, bless Shona. But um, one thing also I want to do in terms of kind of threading through your Scottish roots is that at one point we see the TV and close up and what Callum's reading and Margaret Tate's there. And obviously Margaret Tate is, a, I think, being rediscovered by a lot of people now as an incredibly important Scottish poet, but also um, an experimental filmmaker who's um, f only one and only feature, she, which I think she made in her 70s, Blue yeah. Black Permanent, um, was actually made 30 years ago, um, 1992. So it was I, the I first I film in Scotland directed by a woman. Yeah. Yeah. And she was actually in the sort of 80s and 90s, there was like basically her and Sally Potter. So it's kind of, it's lovely to see her reference. And I just, I, had you discovered her or is it kind of something you again, you're going through this phase of learning and... Yeah, like I think a couple of years ago when, you know, this film was already firmly um, in my mind, um, Blue Black Permanent played on Mubi um, and a friend drew my attention to it and I watched it and it's really not dissimilar to this film thematically. Um, and even, I mean, not, it's not structurally the same, but it, it, it doesn't have one kind of linear yeah. timeline. And yeah, I, I just like, it's, it's, it's beautiful. And it was an entry point into her work, like her amazing portraits that, that she made of people. And she was just so fiercely independent. And I think she had to be, is the truth. Yeah. 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 Um, but she was, and she was obviously like very closely aligned with Orkney, where she's from, where her family are from. Like her family featured in a lot of her work. There is like a, a big, um, I mean, there's like a space dedicated to her there, right? That, like I'd really lo love to go and see. I think it's amazing to have that like film heritage I in Scotland. I think that's really, really special. And I do remember when we started talking about the project at the BFI, what I loved about you was many things, but the fact that you could refer to kind of Chantal Ackerman in terms of how to understand what you were doing. And I kind of, again, I feel that you, you, you've been building a lexicon of filmmakers that you respect and kind of want to have a debate with and that also feeds into After Sun and then is that important that kind of debate that rig rigorous debate yeah it's like the film equivalent of like intertextuality or yeah. something you know like drawing like sometimes quite direct inspiration from work that you love like there's a couple of shots brazenly stolen <laughs> I mean really repurposed but brazenly stolen from Sean Tiger I mean like the the camera moving back in the corridor from Hotel Monterey and um, I was moving back and sort of toward the door, so very different. <laughs> and, uh, and the 360 pan at the end, like I, I saw um, a short, very like avant-garde film that she made in the 70s in New York of a camera just repeatedly panning around a room. Mm -hmm. And she, she is in it as she is in much of her early work and she's, yeah, and it kind of finds her a couple of times. Um, and that was, I saw that. And I sat down on my laptop <laughs> and I, I kind of found this this shot at the end of the film and like it's it's different and it crosses different spaces and actually in the script it came around a couple of times and things did change um, but yeah I think that's really fun like finding work that you love and then it find it finding its way into your your own I suppose again just as someone who loves cinema I just love the fact that you have after Sun here and in terms of British traditions we have also there's a uh, there's a film by Mark Jenkins called Ennis Men, which is in Director's Fortnight, which is sort of experimental cinema. It's just undistilled experimental cinema. And it's, it's really important that for me, the experimental end feeds the mainstream. And I think what's, what you beautifully capture is that sort of avant-garde sensibility translated into something that really can impact audiences as well. Yeah, yeah I mean, I, I sit somewhere in the middle of just yeah. about yeah. everything, I think. Especially what you said earlier about the kind of American and British, like, I went to film school in the US, so there is like a, especially production sensibility that I think I have that is very much derived from that experience. And there isn't like national funding body in the US, and so it does breed a slightly different type of independent film industry, especially like the kind of zero budget film industry. Um, but I am Scottish despite my appalling accent. <laughs> and um, yeah, and, and you know, like I, I find myself gravitating toward those stories and, and an idea of home and, and um, filmmakers from all over the world and plenty of European ones. So please, if you must have many questions in the audience, and there's a question right there. 
Hi, thanks very much. Charles, the, the film is incredible. The audience, hundreds of them, all from all over the world, are sitting with the mirror. They were just completely blown away by it the other night. So thank you very much. Um, my question is about the editing a little bit. You talked about, you know, people that you like to work with, and one of them is the editor. But because you're so hands-on, and the timeline, and not giving it away, but like there was a, a lot of different kinds of use of time and editing. Can you? How did you feel about? I mean, was it? How did that get put together? By did you just let them do it and then take a look at it and go, oh, "That's not really had what I had in mind." Or it'd be very interesting to see about that. Yeah. So Blair and I have worked together on um, my last two shorts and on this one. Um, Blair was kind of brought on while we were in production, and he assembled pretty much the film based on the script that we sat down together with, um, like a month or so after wrapping, and then we worked together, like. Um, yeah, I, I was very hands on deck with the edit as well. Like I make money working as an editor in New York for more commercial stuff, but technically it's something I'm really interested in and know how to do. And so, yeah, we'd work kind of side by side in the early days, kind of just taking scenes, the two of us. And, and then at a certain point, once the film was assembled, it's really not a technical job anymore. Like you're just, having conversations about what the film is. Like we had a board and index cards of each scene and there was a lot of days of just staring at the board. And like, <laughs> it always like we were on the phone together and there would be like a period of silence and I'm like, hello? And they're like, oh, we just thought you were staring at the board. <laughs> um, and it just becomes really like, it's, it's editing. It's just not pressing keys on a keyboard, you know? And, and you're trying to kind of find the shape of the film and work out what you can lose, what you have to lose, what, the order might be. I mean, it does hold to the script, but things did move around, you know? And at first you're like, the scene can't possibly move around. And then, and then it does. <laughs> um, so it, it's definitely very collaborative, but Blair's amazing. And there were sequences that he built together that, like, I, I think my brain is quite linear when it comes to editing and, and Blair's isn't. Like, we're very, very different. I think that's why we work well together. Like he's much, she's got like a much better macro perspective than I do. Um, yeah, so it was definitely collaborative, um, but yeah, Blair is an amazing editor and filmmaker. Hi, uh, first of all, congratulations. Your film absolutely destroyed me. <laughs> but I was glad to see that other people were crying too and not just Sorry. me broken in the corner. Okay. No, I loved it. It was for a good reason. I had a question in terms of the writing. Um, because I know you said when you presented the film that it's been seven years and it's uh, captured a lot of your life. How much of the writing in terms of the characters for you connect a lot of sense of the truth through your own experience or and how much of that was became a bit of a, not so much, I don't want to say caricature, but distance of characters taking on their own lives. Like, is there a fine line? Do they blur a lot or, yeah. Um, yeah, I think they do blur a lot. I mean, my, the starting point for writing was like a bullet list of memories and anecdotes from childhood, not from holidays, just from childhood and, and looking at them and thinking about what I might want to include and then breaking the holiday down day by day, deciding which was gonna be on which day, starting to look at like through lines for each character and uh, the starting point for each character was definitely personal. Like me and my dad kind of formed the foundation of it. And then like as you write, um, or as I wrote, I think I brought more of myself into both characters, honestly. And then when actors come on, it just, it's kind of, it's not out the window, it's still the starting point, but it's only the starting point. Like they're just gonna bring their own presence to it. You know, like Frankie brought her own presence to it. She was like the character, but she wasn't exactly like the character. I think they become more alike somehow, <laughs> but like not somehow, like that's what happens. It moves toward the actor. And that's, that's a great part of the process. Like, because writing is so controlling, it's just you alone, you know? It was just me alone for a long time. And then it, you just, it starts to move away from you as each collaborator comes on board and actors are very important collaborators in that respect, which is why in that Zoom, it was so exciting. It's like, there they are, like for the first time. I texted too many people that picture, like stitched together. I'm like, look, here they are. Question. 
Thank you. Um, I guess uh, you'd spoken about enjoying the sort of very collaborative tete-a-tete -tete of NYU and those sort of smaller productions. And I wondered if there was um, sort of some conscious discussion with your producers or uh, like any interventions or um, extraventions about um, making this a space where you could kind of replicate that um, on obviously the bigger scale required to, you know, make a feature. And I guess an addendum, like, is there anything that you have learned that you're like, oh, definitely next film, we need to do this, not this? Like, is there? Um, I don't know. Maybe you guys could speak to that a little bit too. Like, I think the first person on the project was Adela. And then as I was thinking about, and then I suppose Greg. Yeah, I mean, you you knew you wanted to work with Greg, yeah. the uh, cinematographer, and then Blair, um, our editor, who were both part of your NYU crew. Yeah. And I think even though, you know, Blair, Blair had a, like a little bit of ish feature <laughs> experience and like Greg really didn't, you know, um, I think from my own personal experience, like those, those collaborations that come from like your, your film school and your community have really served me well and I've built like a family and a life out of that. So when that was something you expressed being important to you, like it was very easy to support that idea, even though it maybe came with a lot of unknowns in terms of how people were gonna like rise to the occasion of a feature length. Yeah, and, and that like, that was really helpful working with a producer who had those relationships too and understood the value of that, even though on the page you know, it, it might not look so obvious that that relationship counts massively. Um, other questions? I think that's yeah, lovely film, enjoyed it, thank you. I, uh, two questions actually, one was um, the, the cast on the hand, I don't know if I missed, you mentioned it earlier, but I was wondering what that was about in terms of story. And the other side was sort of the producers, was, I was, yeah, the score, the fact you were able to license all that music, but actually affecting some of those musics, I, I just thought that would have been a little bit complicated because like, like under pressure suddenly slows down and I thought, wasn't sure they were gonna allow you to do that and I think you did it on a couple you of Do tracks. you have to ask permission for that? Uh, oh, sorry, oh, of course not, no, no. So. Um, the cast? Yeah. Uh, what do I want to say about the cast? I don't know, I mean, I think it's in the film. Like, he arrives with a broken arm. I think he's told her that he broke it when he fell. Maybe he fell, maybe he didn't. Um, it's okay. I yeah, mean, I, I mean, I think, I think that's, yeah. I just thought maybe I missed something at 8.30 in the morning. I don't think you missed something at 8.30 in the morning, <laughs> no. I mean, in seriousness, like I think, you know, when, when someone like Charlie presents to you a cut of the film that's employed music in, in such an evocative way that supports the storytelling, like it's just our job to go figure that out for her, really. And like, yes, of course, like there were many conversations, it was nuanced, it was a lot of back and forth, it was yeah. time spent, but like that's what we have to do. Exactly. You know, just work out the relationships first and then go back and present your idea and you know we were in a really fortunate position where it worked out under pressure was a discovery during post that wasn't written into the script the way that some tracks were like tender was in the end that losing my religion was so that was a fun one to say hey <laughs> <laughs> no but we saw the first cut i mean it was in your first cut yeah, of the, the film we cut. all experienced it and imagine in, in a way not dissimilar from how you've experienced it and kind of in that moment knew like <laughs> imagine David Bowie. Now imagine Queen. Now imagine both. <laughs> Other questions? You got another question? I've <laughs> That's good. Sorry. Um, I'd be interested in the sort of the collaboration between the two producers and I guess was there like a courting of, you know, ha what was required between you to figure out that, oh yes, I can work with this person in such a sort of deeply trusting way across national barriers and pandemics. You want to go first? I mean, she said yes. 
I was thrilled. Um. Yeah, I guess it's interesting because um, it is such an important relationship and, and you want it to function at the highest level and you want to um, be a, a unified, like, you know, team of, that supports Charlie and never, and like never want her to feel, or any director, I guess, to kind of feel like stuck in weird, gross producer politics. Um, and at the same time, like we didn't know each other very well when we started. Um, we were building the relationship at the same time as building the film. And like, fortunately it worked really well for us, I, I would say, like where, where we found it to be a really beautiful and like fulfilling collaboration. And I think, I mean, I would do it again with Amy in a heartbeat. Um, so that was a little bit luck and I mean, she's very, very amazing and good at what she does and like, <laughs> like a fun hang. So, you know, it worked, but yeah, I mean, it was, yeah, as t to your point, I think when, you know, the film was building together, we were going through the financing conversations together. I think the great thing about working with Adela was we would just be incredibly honest with each other and there was, you know, everything was just very straightforward, you know, like everything was on the table. We'd be, you know. We knew what we needed, and so we would just be really frank about that with each other. And Pastel as well, Mark and Barry. Yes, there's other people here who are not <laughs> represented on You're stage that are part of. Um, but no, it was, I mean, for me personally, it was a great, it was a great experience. So. And it's also fair to say, uh, Amy, because when you met in Sundance, you had, were, were there with The Nest, which is, was a, yeah. Duncan, an American, well, American European yeah. filmmaker. So again, you, making his, his first feature in the UK. So you were kind of used to navigating, I suppose, that kind of, again, that indie American sensibility and, and finding yeah. a sort of European idiom. Well, I think for me, I mean, obviously, Adela is from a sort of filmmaking background. I, um, I came into the industry as an assistant to director for years. So I knew having been having collaborated so closely with them, you know, those things that actually really, really matter. And when someone tells you that they really, really need something to work out, then it's really like that is your, that's what you're there to do and to try and provide, so. Um. Well, and I would just I was also add, like when we were building the project and thinking about what a partnership with a, with a UK producer would look like, it wasn't, it wasn't automatic or assumed that like we would both be together physically on the ground producing the film. And I know we talked about that early, Charlie. Like, it's like, yeah, maybe it's somebody who's just helping us, um, you know, build out the crew and like navigate the funding and like is a little bit at a distance. And I think as we were building the relationship and getting to know each other and, and how we work, I think there was a point where we were both like, oh, she's obviously coming with us. Like, she has to be with us can get <laughs> in rid Turkey, of that like, money, guys. you know, for better, for better or worse. Sorry, Amy, <laughs> but like, that was a cool thing to realize through the, through the process of building that relationship that like, we were gonna be true physical partners on the ground. Yeah, exactly. And I think as well, just the virtue of how it came together and the funding that came into the pot and, and speaking to what Adela was saying about casting, the partners that we had on this project allowed a lot of freedom around that. And by virtue of, you know, my collaboration with these guys, we could we could form something that was, you know, really sort of it gave us a lot of freedom, I guess, with that. So, this question there. Oh, Hi there. Um, as the film is obviously well, your background actually, it, having grown up in Scotland and then moved to New York, and the film is obviously Scottish, sort of based. Do you think British audiences or European audiences and American audiences will take different things from the film? And how, will do you th how are you expecting the reactions of the different audiences from your, your experience of, of what audiences are like in those two nations? I mean, one thing that's been nice about screening the film, finishing the film and bringing it here is we're really seeing audiences react for the first time. If you'd asked me before it screened, Maybe I'd have said maybe, maybe, but no, I don't think so. I think the film is about a feeling and <laughs> feelings are universal, but, <laughs> but, but yeah, so, so no, like I think the feeling of the film holds. Certainly when we were making it, I, I wondered about the music and the specificity of being at a 
Holiday Resort, which is actually quite a culturally British, culturally specific experience. Like many people go to these types of resorts and, and travel abroad in a way that isn't the same in the US because it's such a big country. Um, and I did worry about how that would translate, but it doesn't seem to have been a stumbling block. I mean, sure, I'm sure people who did go on those holidays are going to respond to like details that other people wouldn't. Um, but in terms of like the overall impression of the feeling, like the film is about the characters, it's not about the place. Thank you. I think we've got time for one more question. Has anyone got the last question? I can't believe I was just recorded saying feelings are universal. <laughs> um, there's a question there. Um, it'd just be interesting to hear what's next for you. Yes, it would, Charlie. <laughs> <laughs> um, a nap. <laughs> a 90 day nap. Truly, it's a little bit of time. Um, I'm not in a rush. I think you basically deserve one great holiday, but possibly not <laughs> in a Turkish holiday resort. But I just feel, I feel, I feel that, you know, it's, 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 it's been so fantastic to see you here and, and, and get this response. And again, just to thank everyone here and thank you. You deserve the best break. Um, and Adela, Amy, um, Charlie, I just want to thank you for being here um, and also thank the UK um, Pavilion for inviting uh, the team. And I, um, we also kind of, I think, all love the fact that uh, After Sun debuted in Ava Khan's first, the first woman to run a section of Cannes for over 20 years. So it was with particular delight that uh, um, After Sun played in Critics Week. Um, we have a little clip, but meanwhile, please, a round of applause for this wonderful team. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.